This is the Vanguard Podcast, and today we are welcoming to the show author, film director, and public speaker Frank Schaefer. A fundamentalist Christian in his youth, Frank helped spearhead the pro-life movement and the religious right takeover of the Republican Party, a movement which has culminated now in the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade, the ultimate goal in some respects of the anti-abortion movement. Frank, can you briefly explain to our audience the way that you and your father were instrumental in this movement going back to the 1970s and why you eventually abandoned the religious right and became one of its harshest critics? Sure. I, I mean, you know, I'll be 70 in August. So let's just put this in perspective. 50 years ago, in my late teens and early 20s, I was the son of Francis Schaeffer, who at that time was, I guess, the leading evangelical theologian intellectual uh, you might say C.S. Lewis and G.K. Chesterton, who was Catholic, were known in the same vein of being people who gave thoughtful uh, apologetic arguments for Christianity. And then uh, Roe v. Wade came down and it happened at the same time as dad and I were working on a film series called How Should We Then Live, which was about history, art, and culture. But the last episode of that series, Dad used as an example, the Roe v. Wade decision, not so much about abortion itself, but about what he felt was judicial overreach of rolling back all the laws in all the states. And that would have been the end of it, except C. Everett Koop, who later became Surgeon General under Ronald Reagan, was a family friend, talked me, who at that time was a teen parent, uh, having gotten Jeannie pregnant when we were 17 and 18. By the way, 52 years later, we're celebrating our anniversary in June, so we're still together. Little footnote on the way by. Um, but we had just had this baby, and abortion was something that we hadn't really thought about in terms of that pregnancy, but we were living in an evangelical community that was intensely supportive of us. Free place to live, medical bills paid. You know, we might as well have been in a Scandinavian socialist country. Um, and that was in Le Brie Fellowship, which my parents started in Switzerland. It was an American ministry, but in Switzerland. Coincidentally, my dad got extremely well known in the evangelical subculture globally because of a number of books he wrote that were totally unrelated to politics as it later developed, simply about Christian apologetics, arguments for the faith, philosophy, art, culture. But then after we made this film series, How Should We Then Live, which was incredibly successful, both the book and the film shown all over the country in seminars and then later in churches and schools and colleges and so forth. C. Everett Koop talked me into making a second series that would be on what he called the life issues, abortion, infanticide, euthanasia, the whole idea of a, of, of, of a loss of the sanctity of human life. And this was based on the fact that though he was a Protestant evangelical, he basically had the view of the Roman Catholic Church about abortion at that time. And he had been on the anti-abortion side for about 10 years before that. Your, your listeners and, and viewers may not remember this, but back in the 1960s and 70s, evangelicals were just as much pro-choice as they were anti-abortion. And so Dr. Koop had been going around trying to convince evangelical leaders I'm going to repeat that, evangelical leaders like Dr. Billy Graham, the evangelist, Dr. Criswell, president of the Southern Baptist Convention, the heartland of American conservative fundamentalist biblical Christianity, they were pro-choice. Uh, in fact, Criswell even preached a sermon on why he thought women ought to be able to have abortions if they fell pregnant um, and didn't want to be. So, you know, a lot of folks today look back and they think somehow that the anti-abortion crusade that evangelicals have been involved with recently that put Trump in the White House, for instance, and is the litmus test of all the judges he appointed, is part and parcel of evangelical Christianity, sort of like the resurrection of Christ. Of course, it's always been that, not at all. So when we made that film series, I was an ardent anti-abortion activist along with my dad, convinced that we were right, everybody was wrong. It was really much more of a pushback against feminism. It was very misogynistic. And Dr. Koop was, really had a bee in his bonnet he, about abortion. This was a big thing for him. He kind of pulled us into this. And then dad made this film series with him that a lot of historians credit as being the beginning of the evangelical movement. So one more thing I'll just note, we had so much trouble talking other evangelicals into taking part in this that unlike our seminar tour with How Should We Then Live that filled stadiums, 
uh, the Grand Old Opry, Madison Square Garden. You know, we were looking at empty seats. So, you know, I can remember distinctly coming back to the Grand Ole Opry four or five years later. My dad was even more famous, but on the issue of abortion, nobody would come to the seminars. So we filled half the front row, whereas we had packed at every single seat sold out when we came with the series on art, culture, philosophy, theology. And uh, so you have to realize that the first thing that my dad did and I did in terms of the anti-abortion movement wasn't to go up against secular humanists and all these other groups of people that you would think of from an evangelical point of view, but argue with other Christians. Billy Graham never signed up, Dr. Criswell didn't, but then in later years, Franklin Graham, for instance, becomes a right-wing evangelical leader that feeds Trump a list of Federalist Society judges that have been picked because they are anti-abortion. So that's how much it changed. And so we were part of that. And then their second question was, why did I get out? It's simply the ugliness of the evangelical fundamentalist subculture as it was developing. And by the way, by comparison, the subculture I left in the 1980s was benign. You know, there's no QAnon. Nobody's, you know, uh, coming up with these crazy conspiracy theories. No election result is ever challenged. Um, you know, if a, if a Democrat wins, uh, you know, like Bill Clinton, Bill and Hillary are disliked, but nobody's saying they're not really, he didn't really win. You know, that's this era. So back then, evangelicals were still much more moderate in their approach. Um, I got out, uh, I was really out of the movement by 1990 when my first novel, Portofino, was published. It's a work of humor at the expense of fundamentalist evangelical missionaries. It's written from the point of view of someone who, like me, grew up as a missionary kid. It became very successful and basically was my ticket out of the evangelical movement because um, they felt that I had betrayed them by writing about a family similar to my own and, and really, really from a point of view of humor um, at, at the expense of the, the kind of fundamentalist ideas. And then after that, in thinking through a lot of issues, um, the, the, the kind of hate-filled ugliness of the anti-gay element, the anti-woman element, all these things were something that I just couldn't deal with anymore. And one last ironic note, one of the reasons that I started leaving the evangelical community is how different it was from the small, humble, pious mission I was raised in. So La Brie Fellowship was a faith ministry. It had you know, evangelical theology about the lost and the saved, but it wasn't ugly. It wasn't mean. Gay people were accepted. Uh, kids would come back in the 1960s and 70s and, and uh, you know, if they were in a relationship with somebody, a gay or a lesbian relationship or living with someone, quote, quote, outside of marriage, they weren't thrown out, uh, nor were people who took drugs. It was an open, inclusive place, not because it was liberal, but because my parents really believed in sharing the love of Jesus. So the great irony, the greatest irony for me is that the last six or seven years of my dad's life, because it became so politicized, sort of defines him the way he's remembered. Whereas anybody who had gone to his ministry back in the 1950s and 60s from today's evangelicals would be shocked at how open and kind and liberal it was. So the first thing that kind of pulled me out was just realizing that this movement I was part of was a, a, a hard-assed political movement that had nothing to do with the Christianity I'd been raised in. And then in questioning everything, I, I eventually abandoned my evangelical faith completely as well and wrote books like Why I'm an Atheist Who Believes in God to Explain My Journey Out. So that is a long answer, but you asked two questions. So cut each question in half. It's only half as long as it sounded. And I'll yeah. answer quicker next time. But you asked for a big background, and that's the background. No, that was a, that was a spectacular. And, and I just had a quick follow up question to that, you know, you, you spoke a little bit about how, uh, you know, one, uh, just about how, you know, people would be shocked at how liberal and accepting, you know, the faith based community that you grew up in was in comparison to the much more, you know, prejudiced, ugly, uh, evangelical movement that we see today. But you also mentioned how, um, you know, it, people were reluctant to, you know, get on board with the anti-abortion messaging that this was somewhat fringe in the evangelical community. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what made what, what made that switch happen? Because uh, now it seems like the evangelical community is almost in one in the step. Like it's assumed if you're an evangelical that you're going to be passionate about the abortion issue. I'm wondering sure. what caused that uh, change and, and um, uh, when when that occurred. 
Well, several things. And the first is going to sound very self-aggrandizing, but it's not because I'm really sorry I made the series. But I'm a pretty talented person when it comes to art and communication. And I made a really hefty piece of propaganda, you know, five episodes. And they really, really, really were convincing. And Dr. Coop is no fool, heavyweight intellectual, surgeon in chief of Philadelphia Children's Hospital, lots of scientific chops. My father was at the height of his fame and I made them a good film series. So the first thing is we convinced people with that series who hadn't thought about it. It was a very powerfully delivered message. Point two, there were two groups of people that found it very, very useful to cash in on this. And it was cynical. One was the Republican leadership itself. You see, you have to understand that the, the integration of the schools and the fact that the courts had ruled in favor of uh, integrated education and so forth had blown up in the face of a lot of conservative Christians. For instance, Jerry Falwell, the pastor, was a segregationist. He was kind of out of ammunition in his culture war things because it had been taken away from him, wasn't cool anymore. Two things they were casting around for, you know, that fit the bill. One was the feminist movement scared them. But rather than just saying, hey, we don't believe women should have careers, we don't believe there should be equal rights, abortion was a, a good way to attack feminism in an oblique manner. Oh, no, it's just about the baby, you know, we're pro-woman. So it sort of let them off the hook of a very anti-feminist uh, position. But then the second thing was there were all these Republican leaders that found it very useful because, again, going back to something people don't realize, the big knock against evangelical Christians in the 50s and 60s, that they were an absolutely apathetic majority, most, many of whom didn't even vote, and half of them were voting for Democrats, and they couldn't be co-laced into a block. So Paul Weirich, who was a Roman Catholic direct male activist, very brilliant guy, and, and people like him on the, on the right wing of the, of the Catholic movement in the United States, welcomed the evangelicals and explain to them that if this could become an issue, um, it, would be, it would give them access to power because they would get people elected who would owe them their election as Ronald Reagan did, for instance, who then changed his position on abortion having legalized it in California, then changed it when he became president. And it also fit very well with fundraising because evangelical fundraising is always based on scare tactics. The sky's falling, terrible things are going to happen if you don't help us stand against fill in the blank the homosexuals, uh, gay rights, lesbian marriage, abortion, whatever it may be, um, that's how the money gets raised. That's how people like Pat Robertson and Dr. Dobson with Focus on the Family, that's how they built empires. And that is Christian ethics are being taken away from us. The country's going to hell in a handcart. We're standing between you and a kind of a secularist apocalypse in which evangelicals are being targeted as the enemy. You're laughed at. Your schools are being shut down. Your kids are being taught evolution in schools. So the evangelicals are always casting about for issues with which to, you know, keep the faithful energized. So there's a couple of things just to recap. Energizing the faithful with an issue that was very useful to evangelical leaders having run out of the segregation esteem. Um, they hadn't changed their views, a lot of them. They were still racist, but they, had, they, they needed new issues. A Republican Party that was looking for any way they could to get more religiously motivated voters because it was a toss up between them and Democrats. And there were plenty of evangelicals voting for Democrats. And then some cynical evangelical leaders who saw this as a path to power for themselves. So that it was a lot sexier, a lot more fun, a lot more money, a lot more interesting, a lot more ego feeding to be a national figure on the steps of the Capitol making speeches about gays than just preaching from your pulpit at Jerry Falwell's church, for instance. Um, and so that's how it became a thing. If it hadn't caught on, they would have gone on to something else, gay rights, whatever. So they threw out, there were several things going on, but the, the litmus test aspect of the abortion issue was perfect for them because it made everything very simple. You know, if you're with us, this is what you do. And then the political leadership. And then when you see it most simply, uh, clearly is in the election of Donald Trump where you have millions of evangelicals saying, yeah, but he's good on abortion, bad on everything else terrible human being, but um, he, is, he is putting uh, anti-choice anti judges in office. He's going, uh, he's got a list from the Federalist Society that Franklin Graham and others gave him, and he's ticking it off and doing what we asked him to do. So that's the deal. That's what happened.
Right. And they were correct to do so because ultimately he did stack the court with the justices who have oh, now yeah. gone on to uh, overturn Roe v. Wade, at least according to the leaked Supreme Court draft. Yeah. What was your reaction, Frank, when that news hit? Were you surprised or did you know this was coming? I have been saying, you know, I, I if you check my writing and my tweets and my blogs and the things I wrote for Huffington Post when it was starting and talks I've been giving, I've been telling people two things for 30 years, okay? One, take the evangelical right seriously, okay? Second, there is an underbelly to the evangelical right that is extremist, and they now run the movement. The moderates are gone, just like they are in the Republican Party. They still have churches. There are still some sort of respectable evangelical churches that are not politicized, but the energy is all with the high, the high pressure right wing stuff. And I predicted a long time ago that Roe v. Wade was going to be overturned because this group of people have been abysmally underestimated by the left. The Democratic Party has acted for decades as if religion doesn't even exist. They've never addressed any of the issues or concerns. And they are portrayed as the devil incarnate by people who tell, you know, who tell them the public, their public, you know, that these people are child molesters. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff. So all of a sudden it actually happens and everybody's saying, what happened? Well, really what happened is that for the last 40, almost 50 years, a group of people have been playing a very long game and they've been very successful. Um, and, and meanwhile, on the left, you have too many people who are concerned about some kind of identity politics. They get off on all sorts of tangents. You know, you're, you, you've got the Supreme Court about to roll back women's rights across the board, uh, you know, in a 50 year increment with Amy Coney Barrett and the rest of it. And meanwhile, you know, the left's trying to work out correct pronouns for expectant mothers and whether these can be called women anymore or whatever. And that way lies madness. So while the left has been mired in linguistic and political details that may or may not be important enough of themselves, the right has been single-mindedly focused on an issue. Okay, so the energy has been 100%. It hasn't been divided between Black Lives Matter and transgender rights or gay marriage or, you know, women's ability to divorce, you know, no fault divorce, all these other social issues. The left has had a lot of things that it's been concentrating on, some of which are very good, by the way. I'm not being critical of that. But the right has had a single focus. Put people in office who are going to reverse Roe v. Wade. Put people in office who are going to reverse Roe v. Wade. Put people in office who will reverse Roe v. Wade. Federalist society bought into what my dad was telling people in places like Oral Roberts University. Hey, don't be a missionary, don't be a pastor, don't be a Sunday school teacher, become a lawyer, work your way into the system, change the courts. So the message of Roe v. Wade to the evangelicals was loud and clear finally, and that is you wanna change something, dominate the courts. And they've taken 50 years and they've gotten there. They dominate the courts. So the lesson was learned. And meanwhile, the left dissipated its energy on tons of stuff and, and uh, all of which was threatening to this group of people and simply was grist for the mill. And now, of course, it's gone out into the stratosphere. It's no longer in the area of reason at all. It's like a new religion has replaced evangelicalism and it's right-wing fascistic, white nationalist, na Christian nationalist politics. So it isn't even the same movement I left. Yeah, to, to follow up on that, uh, Frank, you know, you mentioned how earlier a little that, uh, you know, it could have been anything if if the anti uh, abortion uh, didn't catch on, they would have gone for something else that would have been a, a way of bringing those evangelical voters into a block together. And I'm wondering now that they have all of this power now that, you know, they've been successful, as you said, they were they had 50 years of being narrowly focused on stacking the courts and attaining, you know, evangelical, um, you know, right wing fascist uh, power structures. Uh, do you think that, you know, they're going to limit themselves to just overturning Roe v. Wade? Or do you think that they will find broader ambition, something that will continue to unify the base? And, you know, uh, do you think it's hyperbolic to say that they would be, uh, you know, interested in going after things like, you know, gay marriage? Do you think that, uh, you know, that they would continue to kind of uh, try and reform uh, the culture to fit their narrative or their uh, agenda? No, it's not. Unfortunately, it's not far fetched. Um, 
this is not hyperbole. The, the fact of the matter is, look, you only have to look at Amy Coney Barrett. Exa if, you know, if she's not the key to everything and there's no conspiracy here. But if you look at Amy Coney Barrett, you have in her a template for everything. OK, so let's look at her. She's a staunch conservative Roman Catholic of the right. OK, mother of seven, who's absolutely certain she's right about everything on issues like this. But she also was a member of a far right, bizarre, evangelical derived charismatic cult called uh, what was it? People of um, people of the way or people of whatever. I keep thinking Handmaid's Tale, but that's the book that <laughs> they called themselves handmaids. But anyway, she was part of people of the is it people of the way? So whatever it might be, my mind is blank on that. So you've got someone that combined two, two groups. You've got someone who is a conservative Roman Catholic, ardent pro-lifer. You have her, her theology as part of an evangelical subculture that has charismatic roots, that's absolutely extremist and teaches theologically to its women that they must be subservient to men and obey their husbands. So a fully full bore patriarchal um, view of life, which she has never denied. They took her picture down off their sites because they didn't want to mess up her confirmation hearing, but she's still part of the group. So in her, you've got the template, very bright, very educated, very radical, uh, part of a crazy charismatic evangelical slash Roman Catholic group, plus part of the Roman Catholic Church. What is her vision of America? And that is that it has strayed from its Christian foundation. She believes it had a Christian foundation. And it must be made to go back in order to appease this angry God who either blesses because you're following him like the people of Israel or rejects you and you become accursed. This is straight up theocracy. This is straight up theology that could be drawn from the imams of, of Saudi Arabia or, you know, straight out of Tehran uh, yesterday morning from the Ayatollahs. This is not American politics. It's totally foreign to most secular observers. They don't get it because they've never really mixed with people who are at once seriously unhinged, deranged religious fanatics on the same level that say the Taliban was or the Ayatollah Khomeini. It's in a Christianized, white, respectable, nice private school, well-dressed form, but it's radical. And the fact that she's not alone anymore because the, the last attorney general under Trump gave a speech at Notre Dame. Uh, Barr talked about exactly the same thing, saying we've got to, we're voting for Trump because we've got to roll back the secular humanist onslaught. This is all code for turn America into some form of theocracy, where the constitution is trumped by biblical law. And so it all goes back to this idea of people like Rusas Rashtuni that nobody's heard of and the other theonomists who believed in what they called reconstructionist theology of, of taking the Old Testament law, applying it to modern culture. And now it's become mainstream through people like Amy Coney Barrett and her ruling on Roe, but it will impact other things. And a hint of that was during the Obama administration, you had schools like Gordon College in Wenham, Massachusetts, suing the Obama administration along with Hobby Lobby and others for the right not to pay for insurance coverage for their women employees for contraceptives. It's on the list. So you know for sure that's gonna be part of it. And that'll be done under the rubric of religious liberty. Same thing with employing gay people. Gordon wanted the right to fire gay people or deny students uh, a place at the school based on their sexual orientation. And they were suing not on gay rights, they were suing on religious liberty. So the first tactic of Amy Coney Barrett and Barr and these other people is, is to present themselves as aggrieved victims of a secular liberal onslaught. They need to redress that by claiming religious liberty on, for instance, not wearing masks in church, gathering when other institutions were shut. The court ruled in favor of churches doing that, becoming hotbeds of COVID uh, spreading because religious liberty was deemed more important than public health. Well, where's that written down anywhere? Nowhere. This is theocracy. This is imams. This is, this is not American democracy. Then one last step. These same folks believe that they are right to the extent that what they do supersedes democracy. So that when it gets to Trump saying he's the president and Biden wasn't really elected, and you see all these state officials rewriting and writing stuff 
into state legislation to give them a, put them in the position to overrule election results on one hand, and on the other hand, to, to attack the right to vote by black and brown people by various nefarious means of everything from denying people water as they stand in line in one polling station where there ought to be 20 uh, and so forth to other things. So it's kind of a pincer movement. And, the, uh, and, and what they learn from the abortion thing is that if you just stick with it. And then if you look at the people they serve, these are radicalized armed people, many of them white, lots of them with lots of weapons. They're angry. They, they now are stopping to say, they're, they're no longer saying that we are trying to convince people. They're talking in terms of taking it back. So the insurrection that we saw January 6th is an example of where this suddenly bubbles up and you see its true nature. And where that shows up another time may not be an insurrection. It may just be some whacked out uh, state legislature in Idaho um, finding a way to overturn an election result with no redress. It may just be Amy Coney Barrett ruling, writing a, an, an opinion for the majority five years from now on why women's contraceptives should not be covered because there, she claims that three of the methods out of the seven used are abortifacient, uh, stopping the implantation of the egg. So it's not gonna just be one big thing, but it's a general direction. And of course, the only way to do anything about this is to elect Democrats who appoint different kinds of people and have just as long game as they did. But who knows how this will turn out? We know that we're not at the end of the cycle yet. Yeah, well, that's an interesting note you just made, Frank. And it reminds me of something you were saying a little bit earlier in our episode about the failure of the Democratic Party to counter effectively, to effectively resist this hyper-focused movement, this hyper-focused Republican Party, which again has now succeeded. And while I agree that Democrats are certainly obviously better on this issue than Republicans, there's no question there. Um, I think a lot of people, myself and Zach included, feel frustrated with the fact that uh, we have been electing Democrats. Joe Biden is president. Democrats have the Senate and the House. Um, mm -hmm. Yet there's, there doesn't seem to be a, you know much effective resistance to this um, striking down of Roe v. Wade. Senate Democrats on Wednesday failed to pass legislation that would enshrine abortion rights into federal law, which is something that Biden promised to do if elected. Uh, in your view, is the Democratic Party currently fighting aggressively enough to resist the end of reproductive rights in America and this burgeoning Christian fascism that you talk about? And if not, what should they be doing to effectively counter this movement? Well, obviously they're not, or we wouldn't be in the place we're in. And we would, we, the filibuster would have ended and so forth. But the problem is the Democratic Party tent has been too big. You know, Joe Manchin is not a Democrat. He's a Republican posing as a Democrat and same with Christian Sinema. And there are others, but I've got to also be critical of the left. And that is, you know, and this is not a, this is a plug for my new book, but it actually is very apropos. You know, my new book, Fall in Love, Have Children, Stay Put, Save the Planet, Be Happy is an argument just as much about the failure of the left as the right when it comes to actual family values. And that is the left has become synonymous in most people's minds of putting a kind of a high powered 1970s feminism ahead of all other considerations when it comes to family. I'm not talking about abortion. I'm talking about where have we been for 30, 40 years fighting for paid parental leave for men and women and non-binary people and not some shitty two weeks but at least 16 weeks, maybe six months, like most European developed countries. Where have we been in, in saying that it's unfair that women have to play the career game uh, in exactly the same way that men did in the 1950s and pretend they don't have families? And I don't just mean kids, I mean elderly parents that need help, but you can't admit that you're on the way to help your mom uh, get settled in her new apartment because that doesn't sound businesslike. So, you know, what I argue for in the book is that both the left and right have a, the wrong idea of what success is in this life. And that is, it's about career and money. And that's where the left and right are exactly in lockstep. And what the left would be much better placed now to do if they had made it clear for the last 30 or 40 years that they were the party of actual family values, paid parental leave, women being able to take time out of their careers, go be with their children, suffer no consequences dads stay in, at home and work on their laptop at home so they can take care of a toddler, nobody hiding their families, this ridiculous cycle of fertility where you wait until you're 40 and then try to have a child and then have 15% of IVF, 15% chance of IVF working and all the heartbreak and the, and the, and the 
miscarriages and everything because the, the, the so many men and women, non-binary people and others have bought into this capitalist system that just grinds the life out of our, uh, our, our daily existence and a total imbalance of work and life. If the left was synonymous with real family values, and I'll give you one example, the, the child tax credit Joe Biden brought in that briefly lasted temporarily, lifted millions of American children out of poverty. And then the Republicans wouldn't let it go forward or Joe's, uh, or cinema or, or mansion. We, you know, forget abortion for a minute. Where is the outcry across the board for that? Here's a popular measure that lifts millions of children out of poverty. Meanwhile, on the right, they're claiming to be pro-life and they're the ones knocking all this down, but the Democrats shouldn't let them get away with it. The Democrats should have been screaming bloody murder about the anti-child, anti-family hypocrisy, and also criticizing their own movement for being far too beholden to high powered careerism, like the best thing you can do in life is stay in college, get a master's degree, then maybe even a PhD so you can earn more money and get that corner office. And that the greatest sin on earth is that there's not more women in on the boards of major American corporations. I'm sorry, the greatest sin on earth is there's not more men, women, children, non-binary people alike who are living happy, fulfilled lives in balance where career is not everything. And that's what the book is about. And I also get into abortion in that and I get into my background, but let's just say it. And that is that until we redefine our idea of success in this life and, and have it be about a whole life and not just careerism, the left is gonna have a hard time convincing anybody to do anything because if you just took it on the surface, what we're all about is high powered careers, startups in Silicon Valley, sexy jobs, highly educated people with liberal views, that is not cutting it in Heartland America where they're trying to figure out how a woman working three jobs is going to go home and have a baby when she's gonna return from giving birth or a C-section still bleeding with the stitches still in her belly because she's gotta go back to work three days later. Nobody's made provision for her. If Democrats could start addressing real family values, not this uh, anti-feminist, anti-woman uh, bullshit that we came up with in the seventies about abortion and women staying home, but real feminist values. How do we have women in the workplace working with full competence and equality with men, but provide for the kind of care for childcare, schools and other things that we all really care about? That's the problem. The Democrats got so sidetracked on so much identity politics and nice liberal talk, did not deliver on the stuff like the child tax credit people really care about. And then when we had this chance with COVID, because the Democratic Party has been infiltrated by so many people on the right themselves, did not stand up. You know, if at this point we had passed a really generous paid family leave, the child tax credit was still in place. We were, we were spending massively on revamping our educational system. Childcare was no longer a problem for any woman in America, no matter what her income. We would be able to stand up and say, we are the party of pro-life. These, these Republicans are fakes. But the fact of the matter is Democrats haven't delivered that much. And, um, and so, you know, we're really in a rock and a hard place because what's winning now is the hysteria on the right. And the Democrats don't have much to point to because we, we've been chasing the same values. Money, 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 career, career, career. Go do some big sexy thing before you even have time to fall in love. Well, that's just bullshit. People aren't happy. Loneliness is skyrocketing in the teenage population. And, and we don't have any answers for it because our programs are too surface and they haven't gotten down to where things are. And I just wanna say again, the child tax credit was a really big deal. It lifted millions of kids out of poverty. It came and went in a heartbeat, now it's gone. Okay, if the Democrats had drawn the line on that and said, you know, we're not doing anything until this is made permanent, we would actually have something to talk about, but we don't. So all the sound and fury is about the bubbling, frothy, liberally talk on the left. And on the right, it's just this one, one note focus towards bringing America back to God, which is roll back row, then roll back gay rights and so forth. So I think we're in a, we're between really a rock and a hard place, but the Democrats better start really delivering some stuff ordinary Americans can see. Ordinary Americans, the majority, the 99%, give them something they can get their teeth into um, before it's too late. That's the deal. 
Yeah, no, that's beautifully said, Frank, and I happen to agree 100%. I think that's a, a perfectly accurate analysis of the Democratic Party's failure to truly embrace the kind of policies that would change uh, people's lives, you know, middle yeah. America, working class kind of people in favor of this kind of subservience to corporate America and getting everyone to work uh, nine to five on a weekly basis. So I, I, I 100% agree. I'm really looking forward to reading your new book as well, Frank, and I urge everyone in our um, audience to not only check out your new book, but also your memoir, Crazy for God, which is a fascinating read. Um, thank you so much for your time today, Frank. Such an insightful conversation. Really enjoyed speaking as always. And uh, just thanks for taking the time out of your day. Anytime, yeah. Gavin and Zach. Thanks for your support. Thanks for reaching out. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Frank. Take care, guys.